Good morning and welcome to the Baytown Nature Center. We're here for the Brownwood Homecoming. It's May 18, 2002. My name is Steve Custer and we're here for a historic day to document the people who lived in this area and their lives and their recollections. If you would, please introduce yourself and tell us where you lived in the Brownwood subdivision. Okay. <clears throat> um, my name is W.C. Smith. Uh, I moved to Baytown in 1970. Lived on the east side of town and then discovered that the west side of town, particularly around the water, was really a nicer place to live. And so, not wanting to buy a home, I moved into to Brownwood as a renter. I guess I represent the renters and rented a house at the corner of Mapleton and Bayshore Drive. Uh, lived there for six months. <clears throat> Beautiful house, in fact, the largest house I've ever lived in, terrazzo floors. Would have liked to have bought it because it was going rather cheap. I didn't know why until we had a uh, high tide one day and the water came within a few inches of the foundation. Started asking around, and this was in 1972, and discovered that uh, <clears throat> it was low that there actually had been water in the house uh, in Carla. So, not wanting to move too far, I simply moved up the hill, moved to Queens Court, which was still Brownwood, but I was at an elevation of about 17 feet. That was back on the east side. Uh, lived there for 10 years and then moved to Crow Road into a house that was one of the original houses uh, in Brownwood and have lived there since. Uh, have simply enjoyed, I enjoy the water, <clears throat> enjoy the breeze, uh, have enjoyed the people. Uh, in more recent years, have become acquainted with uh, the first residents of the area, and I'm certainly interested in seeing that uh, over time that the story is told. We'd certainly like the story told to school children who come here for tours and for our tourists who may go through the area. What are some of your most vivid memories of life when you were living inside Brownwood? Well, I, I think. Uh, <clears throat> Discovery was one. Um, in the early years, I knew only a little bit about the Native Americans who had lived here. And, and even in the brief time I was down at the corner of Mapleton and Bayshore Drive, I would prowl the beaches and I started finding Indian pottery and uh, started reading about it. And, and so it was really interesting. You, you discover things. I discovered a cemetery, <laughs> which was in, uh, <clears throat> about to go underwater. Uh, eventually, you found the family and talked to them about it. Uh, I think those are the vivid memories. I think uh, even though we lived in an area where you had lots of chemical plants, uh, Brownwood situated where when the wind's out of the southeast, you, you never will smell Exxon <clears throat> because it blows away from you. And when it's out of the northwest, you're farther enough uh, to the east that you're not picking up the smells from that area. It was a really nice, wonderful, beautiful air. Uh, terrific place to live except for the uh, low elevation. Can you tell us a little bit about some of your neighbors that you might remember? I remember the cat. <clears throat> we inherited a cat from the neighbors behind us. Uh, and uh, that was about it. We were only there six months and, uh, and actually didn't get to know neighbors. In fact, we didn't have any neighbors to the, to the north because they'd already moved out. Can you tell me just a little bit about what you think of the, the new Baytown Nature Center and, and what we have represented in Old Brownwood today? Well, the new Baytown Nature Center actually, uh, it's reclaimed an area that during the late 80s and early 90s uh, had become a, an eyesore, a dangerous place for people to be. It was really unsupervised, uh, an unsupervised 400 acres. Uh, the police couldn't spend a whole lot of time down here and so uh, things that shouldn't be happening were going on all the time. Uh, one of my vivid memories was I lived on Crow Road and it was one of the major access areas and I literally used to chase trash haulers. I'd jump in the truck and <clears throat> they would go up 60 miles an hour down the streets to try to get away from me. It was a stupid thing to do. <laughs> but uh, they usually managed to beat me, get off behind some bush and dump their trash before I could get to them and then they'd take off again. And then one of my other memories is uh, I encountered a uh, a man with a gun, <clears throat> and I didn't have a gun. <laughs> I just told him to get out, and I was really surprised he did. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. And then I walked it uh, daily for about two years, and what I discovered during that period was I kind of kept a running count, and I would estimate one in five people I met were drinking or were inebriated, <clears throat> and it was a dangerous place to be. 
Uh, I'm certainly glad that it's going to be a place that, uh, for families, it's going to be a safe place, it's going to be a patrol place, it's going to be a clean place, it's going to have nature, and it's going to be a place for families to come. I'm delighted with it. Thank you very much. Deidre. Good morning. If you could, please introduce yourself. My name is Jean Shepard. I lived at uh, 148 Linwood Drive in Linwood Park. The subdivision in the subdivision of Roundwood. And tell us when you I moved there, there uh, in 1954. I left. Uh, I was one of the AA groups. I left after Alicia, mm -hmm. so I was there from 54 till 83. Can you tell us some of your? And it was only memories? flooded three times. Oh. During that time, so many of them had much more of a flood history than I had. We our house was only flooded three times. I was at a meeting the other day. And they said that they had been down to the park. And they know when you're down here, you wouldn't believe you were in Bay Tent, that it was so beautiful. I couldn't resist but informing this gentleman that it, that's the way we felt about it when we lived there. It was so beautiful and so peaceful, you didn't feel like you were living in Bay Tent. So uh, that was one way we always had about, about the area. The most memorable things you, you can't take away the fact that we we became not the civic association that was concerned with the beautification, street lights, the year-to-year -year picnic. We became a survival uh, civic association. So I suppose that's what I, I remember most in the, cohesive, the cohesiveness of the neighborhood, mm -hmm. the close-knit neighborhood that we lived in. Tell us a little bit about your neighbors. Oh, my. Well, our street only had about 15 houses on it. Uh, we were very close. Next door to me lived Fuller Lines, who was an engineer at Exxon. On the other side of me lived uh, Dr. Uh, Francis Archer, who was a medical doctor here in Baytown. Uh, Dr. Pennington, who was uh, out at uh, Exxon. Uh, Dr. Norton at Lee College. We had. Uh, uh, then we just had common everyday workers living on that street, so we we had a variety of uh, professions and personalities living there. But Pat and Bud Blackburn lived across the street from us, and she taught swimming and my swimming pool. It was in the backyard. That was a prescription swimming pool for back. I miss it. I wish I had it now. Uh, and after she moved over to Lakewood, and the pool, was, of course, was still in operation, I taught swimming. Uh, to the children and ha had a lot of fun. And uh, we were just close, even though we had a change every now and then of people uh, living in our neighborhood, we were still fortunate to have good people who, who loved to live there. The house that we bought and built back on Linwood Drive that became a rent house, we had one family lived there 10 years. So that was just like their, their home. They were, they were just part of the community. Can you tell me a little bit about um, what brought you to Brownwood? Well, Pete and I were married in 1951, and we were living in Highlands. Uh, he was worked at the plant, and I worked in Houston. And we just felt that we needed to be to where one of us didn't drive so far all the time. And uh, we started, we thought moving to Baytown would probably be the best, best place for us. And we just liked the area. We had looked in Lakewood, we had looked at other places, but there was just something about, we were just a block off of the water, but uh, we were not right on it. But it was still had all of the amenities of living uh, close to, uh, to the bays and the tranquility of the air, because being the peninsula type, you had no business being there if you didn't live there. So that made it very nice. And uh, that's what we liked about it. Did you have a, a favorite spot that you'd really like to see what it looks like today? Right in my backyard was my favorite spot. And I, I, I probably know what it looks like today in the water. <laughs> but uh, that was such a peaceful, peaceful place to be was in the backyard. We had the pool and the pool house and the, just the, just my backyard. <laughs> um, what do you think of what, what you see today? I haven't seen enough yet. But, uh, I think um, what I have glanced at is coming down what I could see. 
I think I'm going to be very pleased. And as I have said many times, if we have to give up our homes for progress, giving it up for uh, a usable, beautiful nature center that's dedicated itself to education. This is not the first time a nature center was mentioned. We had a student from A&M come through here to do his master's thesis on, on, on an area like this. And Susie Brown and I walked with him over the entire subdivision and he said, you know what would be wonderful if they would just turn this back to a nature center and let it become outdoor classrooms for the University of Texas and A&M. Mm -hmm. And he said he thought the state would be glad, this is when we were trying to find a solution, that the state would be glad to become part of the park supporters. We went down to the uh, old city council planning mission co committee, Susie and I did, and told them what the young man said and what a great idea we thought that would be. And we even had the governor that was agreeing to, to be part of it. And they just looked at us and sort of shook their heads, you know, nature center. And now look what's happened with the nature center, perfectly gorgeous and, and very usable. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the storm and, and what drove you out? Of Brownwood. The city of Baytown drove us out <laughs> <laughs> of Brownwood. Um, we were damaged during Alicia, but we could have built back very, it was not much more damage than, it wasn't any more damage than we had in Carla. But uh, we could have built back, but when we saw so many slabs when we came back and the devastation of more houses were more damaged than uh, there had been during uh, Carla that you knew it was not going to be a place to, that you wanted to continue to live. Uh, even though we uh, collected our insurance, we had to deal with the city on the, on the land, and that sometimes got a little frustrating. There were several lawsuits, but it could be a very tiring thing to be alert all the time. And that's just about what it was, alert all the time. But uh, that's what drove us in. Are there any uh, neighbors? that you haven't seen in a while that you would like to see today? Oh, most of our group on our street uh, are no longer with us. They have passed away. But I guess I see a lot of the neighbors, uh, the ones that are still here in Baytown, and uh, I, I would just like to see the old, sure, you know, heck, you always want to see your old <laughs> friends. And Nikki Norton is staying with me this weekend. She drove, she was, uh, it was only one house that separated us on Linwood Drive. She drove in from Midland mm -hmm. to attend the uh, affair, so. Oh. And she drops in occasionally. And the other close friends are, are either in Newport or they live somewhere around. Mm -hmm. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, what do you think would be uh, your most memorable time that you had here? Was it uh, the early part of when you first lived in Brownwood? Was it the later on? What were the good times? When were the good times? Well, you know, we always had good times, even in tragedy. Uh, we were always, you know, the Civic Association had a picnic every year. Uh, it right along in this area at the Little Shamrock. Uh, and after we became the uh, Survival Civic Association, we had a, a parties every time with the drop of the hat because we were trying to promote uh, something for Brownwood through politicians and every time we could get one to come to a party we had a party mm -hmm. so you can't lose that uh, feeling of uh, closeness and and the feeling of relaxation and fun and always promoting your community but I don't know I guess I remember what I remember most would be just the friendship the closeness of our community even in um, after Carla you know, you just can't give up. You have to keep going on and, and just don't lose your zest for life just because you've had your sticks and stones have been damaged. But, you know, everybody got a care box. Every, all your friends were giving you something and, and you couldn't always use what they had given you. And so we blocked off the street. The city allowed us to block off Linwood Drive since it was just uh, one street. And we bought, we had a weenie roast, and we put tables in the middle of the street, and everybody put their care boxes that they couldn't use out on the table, and we just had a little swap shop 
right there and uh, had our picnic and, and, and carry, uh, carried on. So uh, I don't know what I remember the most. I don't know what was made the place so important to me. It was just things like that, that you just didn't give up and you didn't lose your sense of humor and you just, once you dedicated yourself to staying to the end to see what you could do, you were there, good or bad, you were there. So there were lots of, lots of times like that. Thank you so much for coming and talking to us, Jean. You bet. I don't think I can say any more, everybody. This week has been a week of interview. <laughs> <laughs>
we had a large red brick house there, uh, probably uh, 3,500 square feet. And uh, I was, uh, after being born in the hospital, that was my home until I went off to college. Uh, my earliest memory of, of being in Brownwood was uh, the 1943 hurricane when I was very, very young. Uh, <clears throat> sitting in the front room with my mother and hearing the wind and, and stuff blowing very hard, raining very hard. The, uh, the other thing is that back during those times, we, uh, a hurricane would come through. We'd stay at home, listen to it on the radio, and thought it was all great fun. And it wasn't until the, in the 50s that we began to leave the house during hurricanes, but it's not because we had any fear of being flooded, but just we didn't want to be, there was a, a low place between us and the higher ground, and we just didn't want to be trapped out there for a couple of days. Uh, as everybody will probably tell you, Brown was a very beautiful place uh, uh, for my brother and I, and he'll elaborate on this later on. Uh, it was a place where you, could, for a couple of boys, you could had a hundred acres of uh, area to explore with birds and snakes and fish and just a lot of things. One of the other memories I had that probably it was uh, in our neighborhood, we had a, a, a yard man who was from Louisiana, Leo McGee, and he had a Piro. And uh, when we'd have a, a hard storm, northern, it would blow all the water out of Crystal Bay here, except for a few channels, and Leo would go out there and uh, shoot gars. Leo also was an expert fisherman. Uh, Leo later on began to have problems with the bottle and uh, eventually got in the habit of going around and shooting a shotgun off and so we had to move Leo on. But there are a lot of uh, adventures out there. Uh, remember the time, unfortunately, uh, the Kirkpatrick's house uh, burned down. One of the memorable things is they had one of the earliest big RCA TVs and when the picture tube went off it just Kaboom! It was really uh, uh, made a loud noise. Uh, we used to ride bikes, uh, play hide and seek on bikes, and then later on when we got a little bit older, uh, began to have motor scooters and have races. And uh, my brother John, he'll, he'll elaborate on that. But it was very pleasant to, uh, to live in, uh, could play sports, uh, and then just living on the water is uh, very peaceful, very relaxing. Just to sit there and, and look at the water. It's a rather, rather, rather strange phenomenon. I just can't explain it. Uh, one of the other nice things about our house is it uh, had a good view of the, uh, the San Jacinto Monument. And uh, another memory I have, have is a, it, during the nighttime, uh, on a foggy night, you'd hear the ships coming up down the channel going, Woo! Oh, uh, talking to each other with their horns. This is back before you had all the radar and uh, radio communication. Uh, just trying to think of a few other things. Uh, uh, one of the things that I remember about our place is we had a, a, a wide variety of uh, uh, trees. Uh, some I haven't seen uh, anywhere else. We had uh, pig nut trees and uh, had a very large tree outside our back uh, uh, porch, which we never were able to identify. Uh, they were large cedar trees, and some of them succumbed early on. Uh, There's also, uh, <coughs> uh, back then the, the bay was shallow enough that it attracted ducks, and the water was uh, clear enough that it attracted ducks, and there were a number of our neighbors who uh, who uh, duck hunted. I never quite got into that because uh, the best hunting for ducks is when it's cold and rainy and that just didn't seem like too much fun to me. But uh, there was uh, a lot of birds and uh, one, one regret, I'm interested in birds now and that I didn't take a greater interest in and uh, learn exactly what birds we had there. Tell us a little bit about your neighbors. Uh, the neighbors to one side were uh, the, the Stevenson, uh, 
Stevie Stevenson and Helen Stevenson, they had uh, two children, Henry and Alice. Uh, Henry and Alice were uh, uh, younger than uh, John and I, and uh, I used to babysit with them. And uh, uh, early on, before uh, Steve, uh, Stevie Stevenson got married, he had there was another fellow living there, and and uh, his wife came home from the war. She had been in the uh, the ways, and they just moved right into that 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 little room and lived there until they built up in Lakewood. Uh, next to them were the. Uh, uh, early on was the, the Rankies, uh, who uh, had uh, three children. The oldest is Robert, and he's moving back to Texas from uh, uh, California. I uh, thought he might be here. Uh, next to them were uh, the, the Joneses. Uh, Mr. Jones was the uh, manager of uh, J.C. Penney's here in Baytown for many years. And uh, on further down next to them were the, the, the Porters. Uh, Wayne and Winston and Travis, and uh, were the were the sons. Uh, they were they were they were very active in the hunting business. And across from the Porters lived uh, Russ Harp, who was one of my early friends. Do you still stay in touch with any of those today? Yes. Yeah. Well, the Porters and I share a common cousin. So that and uh, Russ Harp lives in Houston. I hoped he would be here. Tell me. Um, which of the storms do you remember the most? Uh, well, probably, you know, most of them kind of remember that. Uh, we, we left the house for, for Carla, uh, not expecting to be flooded. And uh, we went and spent the time with our, some neighbors up in, uh, in Lakewood. So that was quite a surprise to have been, been flooded. But uh, <clears throat> the main difficulty with Carla was it, uh, it brought a lot of oil with it, so it was a very messy storm to clean up afterwards. Mm. But my parents, with the help of a whole lot of friends from uh, Wooster and Lakewood and, and everywhere in Baytown, got their house cleaned up and uh, moved back in it. And they, they lived there until uh, 1977, till my dad decided that keeping up with a, an acre of property on uh, the water was uh, too much and they moved over to Greywood. Do you have a favorite spot here that you would really like to see again today? Well, it's probably where we lived. Uh, it was, uh, and actually it's still, a, it's, it's uh, one of those areas that wasn't cut up into channels and so mm -hmm. it's on the bay. Mm -hmm. You can still tell where the uh, front driveway is and, uh, and uh, even after Alicia, we, uh, we uh, my brother and I cleaned up the house, and while we still owned it, we would some, to sometimes come out and uh, have uh, uh, you know a picnic out on the on the, the, the levee at the back of the house. And we had one there when uh, Texas was having a let's see what was that the 150th year anniversary, and they had the fireworks over at the uh, the monument, so it was a good view for that. Had a number of people out, and really enjoyed it. Well, thank you very much. Thank I, you. Do you have any? Before, how do you feel about what you're seeing out here today, about what they've done with the area? How does that make you feel? Well, I'm, I think this is a, a, a good use uh, of, the, of the property. I think there could have been an alternate use of having requiring people to raise their houses to an appropriate elevation, and you would have had a, a, a neighborhood here with a lot of bayfront property, which is entirely in, in uh, scarcity. And it uh, would have been good to have that on tax rolls, but uh, that wasn't the direction that uh, people were taking. So uh, if, in that case, uh, uh, then this is a good use. One of the things we did, my brother and I eventually sold our property to the city of Baytown. And uh, one of the things we had in, in there was a covenant that if the city chose to do something besides a park or some other equivalent, use of it, if it went to commercial use, the property would revert to us. So I think this is what it ought to be, rather than something else, commercial use. Thank you. Thank you. Ready? 
if you would please introduce yourself and tell us where you lived and okay. where you live there. Uh, I'll do that. I'm John Floyd and I lived at 176 Bayshore Drive, which was basically at the end of Crow Road. Took a right and a left into the first driveway. Easy to remember. Um, and I guess, you know, you start back talking about memories, I think my brother probably made a, probably did a good job of explaining what went on out here. But one of the things was it was a, it was a great wooded area and there's lots of places for the kids to play. The streets were safe, uh, not a lot of traffic. Had shell roads. I remember the, in the summer when it get dry, the old shell road dust would go everywhere because most people didn't have air conditioning in those days. And so uh, you take the old attic fan, it just sucked that dust right on into the house, which was kind of interesting. But uh, I remember you know, growing up on the water, having boats as a kid. I, I, I think we had a had a putt putt motorboat when I was about six or seven years old with the with a ten horsepower Martin on it. We'd putt around all over the bay and. My good friend Robert Booth and I, we built a house on the island across the bay, which is now sunk into the, you can't see the island anymore, but it's still there. If you cut across it with your boats, you'll find it very quickly. Um, and I remember, I remember my brother was talking about a while ago memories, and, and I remember staying on the front porch of the house when I was a little boy, and the Texas City plant blew up. And that explosion was so great that it shook the, it shook the house in Baytown. You can imagine how, how vivid that thing was. And, uh, uh, that, that's probably one of the one of the, the major things that I really remember is, is being a little boy. And you could ride your bike around the neighborhood. I, I, I ride my bike over here today, and uh, it's amazing how small it looks compared to how big it looked when you were a little kid. I mean, because I could ride my bike all around the subdivision in probably about 20 minutes now, and I remember as I was a kid, it seemed like it was real big. Uh, but that's kind of, you know, it, it, was a, it was a beautiful place, and, and uh, I've just moved back to Lakewood about five years ago, bought me a place on the water, and I, I've really been kind of kicking myself that I hadn't done it sooner because it's such a nice, nice to live on the water and wake up, and see the water and see the monument, and, and, uh, and really, it's really, really an enjoyable place. Uh, and let's see what else should I tell you about. I'm trying to think. Uh, Mike told you about all the neighbors, so that pretty well wrapped the neighbors up. Uh, Did you have a favorite spot that uh, your brother didn't talk about? I, you know, I, I don't really know that I did or didn't. I think one of the things is is that, you know, we we, um, uh, we play, I, I was on that water all day long. We were in, in the water, on the water, or, or something. That's basically where I spent the majority of my time. And uh, that or over, over the island, we, you know, the kids all go over the island and play. But uh, we probably spent most of our time in the water. And that's really basically uh, what we enjoyed most of all, I guess. And, uh, and you know, it, it uh, uh, you know, the, my father was a big water fan too, so we, you know, the, the backyard got a lot more use in the front yard. I guess it's probably a good example of that. What, what do you think about what you see here today? I, I think the park's a good idea. I mean, I, I, the, um, uh, you know, you, you would have never gotten, never gotten 350 people to fix this place up. I know that. I mean, they're, 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 a lot of people were in the later stage of their life by the time that the the last hurricane came, and so I think that this this is going to work out fine. Yeah, yeah. And, and my daddy would have liked it. You know. So I think that's probably key. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Hang on. Got a mic. Good morning. If you would please introduce yourself and tell us uh, where you lived here in Brownwood. Okay. Hi, I'm Linda, and I was Linda Underwood, now Raymer, and we uh, lived at 220 Bayshore on the Bayside, uh, down close to I think what's called Wooster Point now. And tell us about some of your most vivid memories of, of life here in Brownwood. I, I think this was probably one of the most fun places to grow up. It was, uh, it was just a dream for kids that loved to be outside. There were animals everywhere, and, and the the bay was our our playground. We just were always in the water, uh, doing just about anything that could happen in water. Some things we mention, some things we don't. And <laughs> uh, we had the run of the place. We you know we rode our bicycles, we rode horses, uh, we ran, we swam, we skied, we fished, we crabbed. Uh, we explored, and it was it was great fun. Tell us about your neighbors. My neighbors, <laughs> uh, the neighbors that lived next door to me were the Hannas, and there were three kids in the family. Bill was uh, just like my brother. We were together all the time, and we had many many fun adventures together. And it, uh, he'll be talking here in just a little bit. Uh, we did. Uh, we went out in his little boat together. We skied together. Uh, if you were a girl in the neighborhood, you had to be a tomboy. That was just the way you survived. But, you know, we did the BB gun thing. We uh, fished for gar. We uh, had lots of friends over. There were always lots of kids. They loved doing the things that we had to offer at our home. So we had a lot of fun doing that. 
Can you, do you have any memories of uh, the, the weather, the storms? Uh, Definitely. I, I remember when we came back after Carla, I remember coming in, we had to go and get shots, and coming in uh, that first day back when, of course, the, the flood was still in place, and we came back in boats down, uh, I think it was Cabinus Street, driving down, just looking, it was just unbelievable. I mean, we couldn't believe it, and, and drove up to our house in a boat, and just seeing that everything was gone, torn up, just shredded, and then in the next few days, as the water began to uh, dissipate, the, the multitude of things that we saw. I mean, I can remember wild pigs running, not wild ones, but they were loose pigs running around. Uh, we even had a toucan in our backyard and uh, things that we would find that were our neighbors because there had been a tornado that had come across the corner. And it, it, was, it was horrible. It was devastating to find out that everything you owned was gone. But, you know, we were a strong bunch. We rebuilt with the help of the community and our friends. So, Did you have a, a favorite spot here in, in Brownwood that you really want to see today? Well, I think a lot of our favorite spots are underwater now, but, but one of the places, of course, would be our home site. Uh, but down at the peninsula, down where the pavilion is down on Wooster Point, we spent a lot of time uh, out on that little peninsula looking for shells and crabs and just exploring down there and then uh, of course the island that separated our bay from the ship channel was another place that we enjoyed going but that's been you know that's been underwater for ages so what do you think about what you see here today i'm so proud of you know the work that's been done here because co even coming down two years ago it was quite um, it was still quite disturbing to see you know, the way things look, because there's still quite a bit of structures, you know, that were still up, so it's fabulous. I'm very excited. I'm an educator, so I'm very glad to see that kids are going to be enjoying the same things that we did. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. I'm very glad to be here. Some slides that people didn't sign up for, so there should be some up. Some okay, we're rolling. Good morning. If you would, please introduce yourself and tell us where you lived and how long you lived there. I'm Sandra Wims. I was Sandra Hanna. And we lived at 224 Bayshore Drive on the Bayside, of course. And um, we moved there when I was about four years old. And I lived there till I married my husband in 1964, so 20 years. Tell us one of your most early memories and most vivid memories you have. Well, one of the most vivid memories I have was when I was a really small child. I was We hadn't lived there very long. and. Um, my sister, I persuaded her to walk with me down to the bay, and uh, my mother had told us, of course, not to do that. And we lived next door to the Underwoods, and there was a, a hedge right next to, uh, between the houses, because they had a nursery. And um, my mother got um, a switch. She, it didn't hurt us, <laughs> but it stung like crazy. And she switched us all the way from the bay to the to the house, which was in the middle of our acre. And we never did go down there without permission anymore. That was one of my earliest and most vivid memories. Uh, I, I have memories of of uh, rolling down the hill to the water and uh, sitting out in the evening and watching the sunset, rolling down the hill to the bay. And of course, as a teenager, I loved to spend my solitary hours out on the pier listening to the water. It was a very soothing and relaxing time and I really, I really enjoyed living on the water and I really thought I would never ever be happy anywhere but on the water. But you know, you adapt and uh, don't live anywhere near water now, but it's, it's been a wonderful memory. What do you think about what you've seen here today? It's wonderful. I just can't imagine. I didn't have any idea that this was going on. We don't live in Baytown any longer, and uh, it's it's just wonderful. It really, really is. I'm uh, eager to see the the uh, old homestead site and so forth and so on. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Good morning. If you would please introduce yourself and tell us where you lived. Okay. I'm uh, Linda Hannah Bossing, and I lived on 224 Bayshore Drive um, on the bay side, as my sister just said, and as Linda Underwood also said. And uh, I lived there from about the age one until I got married in 1965. 
What was your most vivid memory that you have of living here in Brownwood? Oh, there are so many wonderful memories of, of Brownwood and the, the peace and the serenity you felt when you were coming down the hill and seeing the monument. And I've always been a, a big fan of Texas. And so when, you know, you drive down the hill and uh, into Brownwood and, or look out the back, we would sit out on the pier and uh, look at the monument and the boats passing and we would wave at the the SO tankers and the people because we could see them vividly from our pier and so those are those are some really fond memories um, we also had a lot of um, good soil at, at our home place and and we had peaches and plums and lemons and limes and tangerines and watermelon and so that was a that was a really fun thing. Uh, we had a wonderful neighborhood, wonderful friends, and uh, we were in and out of trouble a lot because of the the availability of so many resources to get into trouble. But it was fantastic. There were a lot of snakes and things like that, but we learned to adapt. And you always had to have a good dog to protect you. Did you have a favorite spot that you really like to see today? Oh well, yes, back to our home um, and down to the point, but uh, we still live in Baytown, so we have been coming down here until they started closing it off. And our dad used to drive down here um, every day after he moved. And so we're anxious to get back down there. Do you like what you've seen so far? Oh, it's fantastic. And the people have just done a wonderful job. We're very impressed and appreciative. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Please introduce yourself and tell us where you lived and when you lived there. Uh, I'm Bill Hanna. We lived at 224 Bayshore uh, here in Brownwood. I lived there from the time I was born till about 1970-71 uh, time frame. And what was the best part of living here in Brownwood? Oh, by far for me the best part was the bay. I spent uh, most of my afternoons, my summers, uh, out in the water. I uh, had several different boats, rowboats and uh, motorboats and uh, was always always out either fishing, hunting or, or skiing out in the water. What do you think about what you've seen here today? Oh, it's very nice. I mean uh, living in Brownwood we've gone from when, when I was a, a youngster here before Carla uh, it was it was a really a nice spot. I mean it was it was it was an outstanding place to live and then after the subsidence happened uh, the neighborhood in, in the facilities just started going down and so we've seen the extremes and now to come back in and see it you know turn back into where people can enjoy it uh, it's, it's, it's really very very pleasing to see that. Do you have any specific memories of your sisters and your neighbors that you'd like to tell us about? Well they have threatened me that if I talk uh, <laughs> I would be in trouble but uh, yeah, I, I was uh, always picked on quite a bit by them, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was always, you know, always doing things right, but they were always picking on me. Tell us about some of the storms that you've been through down here. Well, uh, certainly uh, Hurricane Carla uh, was the most notable storm uh, that, you know, I can remember before Carla, my dad uh, had us go back in and put all of our furniture up on coffee cans. Uh, you know, six, eight inches up on coffee cans because we never had gotten water in the house before, but uh, we thought, well, if it did get in, it wouldn't be very much. Well, we actually got 44 inches of water in our living room. And, of course, I, we lost all of, our, all of our childhood memories and things like that uh, were, were all gone, but uh, the house was, was pretty well damaged, but we rebuilt. What do you think uh, of what you've seen here today? Oh, uh, very nice. Uh, the people have done a great job. The people that have put this presentation on, uh, they're really to be commended. Uh, a lot of dedicated hard work, uh, and I think the, the people in the area will really enjoy being able to come out here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming today. Could you please introduce yourself and tell us where you lived here in Brownwood? I'm Kay Carter, now Jackie Evanholtz, and we lived at 140 Mapleton. Uh, our dad bought the property when it was underwater. He bought it in the 40s. He bought two acres 
$500 each, and our aunt loaned him the money to pay for it. And he had an agreement with Exxon that if they had extra concrete and stuff into those big barrels of that black sludge stuff that they needed to dump, they dumped it where our lot was. And eventually he filled it in, and then he built a hill, Carter's Folly they called it, and they made fun of Daddy because he built our house on a hill. But then we'd have real high tides, and we were the only ones who didn't get water in our house. <laughs> <laughs> but we've been here since the 40s, since the late 40s. Uh, we'd, I left when I graduated from college, or from high school in 62, and my sister came back with her children and lived uh, in the area for a short while. But my mom stayed here until the end of uh, Alicia, and then she had to leave. What do you remember best about life here in Brownwood? You never had to lock your doors. <laughs> and you could walk anywhere. Uh, people didn't lock their doors. You walked everywhere you wanted to go in the neighborhood. Or you, if you really were energetic, you wanted to ride a bicycle. But it was just like a leave it to be ever growing up. It was, it was a calm place. It was a safe place for the kids to go. And everybody knew everybody else. And you didn't want to get into any mischief because everybody knew your mom and dad <laughs> and told them whatever you did. Tell us about your neighbors. Mm -hmm. The Gieslands had lived here long before us. Fanny Elmo and Reynolds Giesler and their sons Eddie and David. Next door to them were the McHughes, and then the Treadways, and then us, and then I'm going to let Sandy tell you about the people across the slough from us because we have some interesting stories about them. <laughs> but it was, it was like I said, it was just a, a quiet neighborhood. The Bargainers had the farm across the street with the horses, Della and I can't remember the other one's name. They had a horse, and Sandy and I would go over and ride, and when Mother and Daddy were home and the Bargainers would travel on vacations, Mother would go over and milk their cow for them. <laughs> But it was neat, and we lived, we lived in three different houses on Mapleton. One was, a, well, the first two was a frame rent house next door to the Grimes, and then the Bargainers built a brick house, and we bought the lot across the street from the rent house, and that's how Daddy was able to work on it. He worked for Umble, it was then, during the day, or at night, excuse me, he worked at Umble during the night, and then he ran a trucking business during the day, and a lot of the people in the neighborhood had their lots leveled with Daddy's tractor. And, uh, like, after Hurricane Carla, we found our... We lived on Mapleton, and over on Burnett Bay, we found our living room floor, and Daddy went with the tractor to bring it home, <laughs> and he hauled it back home. And when they found it, the the candlestick that was on the mantel was sitting up, standing up on the floor in the Floyd yard. <laughs> wow. No, wait a minute. Excuse me. The boat was in the Floyd yard. <laughs> we washed a little ways. <laughs> Did you have a favorite spot here in Brownwood that you would like to see today? Our backyard. Yep, you can still see from the aerial views, Daddy put our seawall and the treadways and the McHughes, he poured them all at the same time because he was skilled in that ways and the others were not. And that's one of the few straight lines that you can see when you're looking in the aerials because our, our, uh, our, our seawall is still there. Do you remember the storms, the, the flooding in, in oh, particular yeah. that stand out? Yeah, yeah, Carla especially because we weren't going to leave. Daddy wasn't going to leave and Mother wasn't going to leave if Daddy wasn't and Sandy and I weren't going to leave if Mother and Daddy didn't leave. Mm -hmm. And the uh, the military, whichever ones they were, they came out and they, they took us out in waste deep water and made us leave. Mm. Yeah, we get water in the, house, in the yard a lot, uh, but we didn't get water in our house because, again, we were on the hill. But Carla was the worst one, and then, of course, Alicia came. But, yeah, we remember that. Was your house still standing? Um, when, when did it fall down, or when did they tear it down? After Alicia. After Alicia. Uh, Carla, we had a 3,000-square-foot house. It was two stories, and we'd only been in it a year. We'd only finished a year. And we came back, and the, Daddy was building a boat in the garage, and the boat, the boat beat everything out. We had eight studs left holding the house up, and he rebuilt it. And then uh, the studs were the the, bed, the room over the garage was there, and the stairs, and then eight studs, and that's all that was left. And then after Alicia, of course, it came down. But uh, we found telephone poles upstairs <laughs> in the bedroom because we were we were on the water side, mm -hmm. and there were telephone poles in the bedroom upstairs. And everything was gone from downstairs. And it was interesting because as we were leaving and they made us go, Mother, we hadn't finished breakfast, and Mother took her arm like this and swished the dishes into the sink. And we had a, a ceramic tiled drain board. And after the storm, when Daddy was trying to straighten up the foundation to build the next house, you know, to rebuild it, the sink had tumped over that way. The sink was gone. They never found it or the drain board. But all the silverware from the dishes was about two feet down in the mud, and we just kept finding it, digging down in there. And then Mother had a tortoise shell plastic purse and we found it under the under the dirt and the mud out in the bay later, and baby cups and stuff like that. And the fireplace had come down and tumbled down the the mantle and everything, not the mantle, the, the chimney had tumbled down into the living room. And there was a, a crystal pitcher that mother had, and there was not a chip on it. 
Not at all. And we found all our clothes under our property ran a, a what do you call it, with the big concrete pipes to go under a drain mm -hmm. under our property, and they found all of our clothes in there. And that, because it sucked it down in through there. And we found, uh, we found another, the hurricane lamp, the top of it, in our ice cream freezer out in the yard, and it wasn't chipped either. Wow. Oh, that's weird kind of stuff. Yeah. It's very just, strange. Just weird stuff. Okay. Oh, it's wonderful. Like it's, I can't believe that it's, that it's sunk so far. Because <laughs> our, our yard sunk eight feet while we lived there. Mm -hmm. And Daddy had, had measured that. But, I mean, it's gorgeous. And we, could, we can still tell where we live. That's what's neat. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you both. Good morning. Uh, would you please tell us your name and where you lived and what time frame you lived here in Brownwood? Uh, we lived here in 1948 until Alicia. I'm Sandy Carter Bond, lived at 140 Mapleton. And what are some of your most vivid memories of, of life here in Brownwood? We lived on three different houses on Mapleton. And I can remember, although we moved there when I was three, it was a rent house. Of course, I didn't understand rent house. But I could see the bay from the house because it wasn't on the bay. And I'd say, Daddy, I said, why can't we live on the bay? And he didn't want to tell me we were too poor. He said, honey, someday we're going to live on the bay, I promise. And then we moved down, but on the same side of the street. And I could still see the bay, but we had a little water beside us. And a huge turtle, about that big, was found and it crawled up. And I was just amazed. And we put it in a big tub, and my dad said, no, you have to let it go. You don't do nature that way. So we let it go. And I'd say, Daddy, when can we live on the bay? And he said, I promise, honey, someday we're going to live on the bay. Well, we had to move, and we moved over in Wooster. I said, Daddy, you promised. He said, I'm going to fix it. And he bought an old dump truck and an old tractor. And my mom was furious. <laughs> And I said, Daddy, why did you get the dump truck? He said, because we're going to live in Brownwood, honey, on the bay. I said, you promise? He said, I promise. So he went out and he found some part land and part water. And he used that dump truck. And after he had worked at Humble all day, he would take that dirt and he would fill it in. And he would let me go. And he'd let me watch him. And he'd spread the dirt. And he would haul. And it took like three years. And at last, he said, honey, we're going to live on the bay. And he built a little wooden house, and it only had one door on the inside, and the rest of it didn't have any doors. And kids would follow me home from school making fun of my house. And I said, but we live on the bay. <laughs> and Dad taught me about nature. We would sit out on the back, and he would talk about nature, and he taught me how to, how to take care of the ducks that came in that were wounded. And, and I, it just, this, this brown wood, nobody can explain understand unless they lived here. They just can't. But uh, I remember Hurricane Carla and he, of course I was a teenager and I had, he woke us up in the middle of the night and I had my stuffed animal lift fell in one hand, clothed, one change of clothes and on the way out I said, are we going to live on the bay? <laughs> he said, we're coming back. So we came back and I remember we stood on Crow Road, you know, it went down like that and Daddy got in a boat and he went out, and when he came back, he looked like he'd aged probably 50 years. Even as a teenager, you know, when teenagers don't see much, he had just aged. And he, and, uh, he told my mother, I told him, he said, there's nothing left. And my mom kissed him. And she said, honey, we did it once. We're going to do it again. And we did. And uh, we lived there. And when he died, he wanted to die there. But he taught me so much. And uh, he taught me about the ducks they talked about today, and he taught me about the birds. And last night, Jean talked about flowers don't grow so pretty elsewhere. And everybody's yard was beautiful. Just beautiful with the foliage and the flowers, and so much pride was taken. But I read an article in the paper, and it said Brownwood uh, residents were the uh, executives of Exxon, and I wanted them to know that's not true. My daddy was blue collar with grease under his nails, and he worked hard, and most of his friends were that way.
they made this land and they, well, they didn't make it, but they beautified it and they loved it. Tell and that's my story. Tell me a little bit about your neighbors before you leave. Ah, we had a little gully by our, our house and on the other side were the O'Sullivans and they had a Palomino. They had uh, chickens and geese and, and uh, he was kind of gripey and I can remember that. And I wasn't used to gripey people. So when he would get gripey, my dad would say, go in the house, honey, go in the house, because he was old. But across the street, we had the bargainers and he was a farmer. He had two horses, Della and Tony, and he would farm and he would let us ride those horses. And he would teach us about growing corn and growing things and his yard was always perfect and he had the most beautiful roses I've ever seen in my life. Just gorgeous. Uh, the Treadways lived next to us and I, I really don't know anything about them, much about them, but they did have a, a, a dog from, World War, from a war named Ace and you stayed out of his way. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody was just friendly. Everybody just knew everybody and uh, you know as a young child I loved it but it really makes me appreciate it now because there is no place like this anymore. Thank you very what, much. What do you feel about what you see with what they've done out here today? I think if my dad could see it, he'd be so proud. Okay. I, I do. I just, I think it's wonderful what they've done. It hurts because I feel like they took our land because <laughs> we couldn't build on it anymore. But if that had to be, I'm glad it's this way. It's beautiful. And I will join. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you. Good afternoon. If you would please introduce yourself and tell us where you lived here in Brownwood. My name is Shirley Laverne and I lived at 127 Bay Shore. My husband was Bob and we were both involved in the Brownwood Civic Association. We moved out here in about 1968. We raised all four of our children. Uh, the youngest one was starting first grade. No, the youngest one was starting kindergarten. and. Uh, had one three years older, that was Lee, and then Michelle. Three years older was Laura, and two years older was Mark, and they all loved it out here. I, we had a really good good time living in out, out here except for the flooding. <laughs> what do you remember best about, about life here in Brumley? The best stuff was that my kids could, and my oldest daughter told me that this morning. I called her in Houston and I said, well, what do you want me to tell them because they want me to say something. She says, Mom, just tell them it was wonderful to be able to walk out the door and have a good day all day doing what I wanted to do, getting in the water on the bay or in a swimming pool because we had access to several even though we didn't have a pool. And knowing that I could just do that and not get into trouble, not have to have any drugs or alcohol or anything to have a good time. And I just wish that my two daughters could have had the opportunity to, to have that lifestyle living next to the water. What and you, my kids all loved it. What do you remember about your neighbors that you had? Oh, goodness. Well, the Armstrongs lived next door, and my youngest son was my child who didn't think he needed to go to school because he needed to be fishing <laughs> on the bay. And Ms. Armstrong, Mary, was a teacher at, at Lynchburg Schools, but uh, Deer Park school system and she was actually in Deer Park and he happened to be in the Goose Creek School District and uh, But I never could seem to get him with her. I just knew that she could change his mind about school. He actually went all and graduated and has a real responsible position, <laughs> but I didn't think he'd ever make it and Mr. Armstrong was with Lee College and they were wonderful neighbors. Their children were grown. They were older. He had a beautiful yard Caladiums and Azaleas and Oleanders. Harry Hartman and Connie Hartman, his wife, lived across the street. And they were such gracious people. We moved in Bra to Brownwood in September. That year they observed the Laverne family. The next summer, when it got nice and warm, they came over and they said, uh, we would like to offer the use of the swimming pool, which was is a large ceramic tiled pool if you have an adult with the children at all times and we're not using the pool. And so we had that for 16 years, and really about 14, because they, they actually moved and uh, moved over into Lakewood and built a similar house. And Jean and Pat Perot bought it several years ago when Mr. Hartman died. 
and they live in that house down there, close friends of mine. And that was a really good memories. Uh, Bill and Francis Lewis lived two houses over from uh, by the Armstrongs, and they were very, very good neighbors. She was with the library, and he just passed away, and he was with Exxon. But they were all very gracious people and neighbors, and we loved uh, just visiting with neighbors that had children our children's age, the Mutons, Curtis and Agnes. My son Lee was younger than Mark, but he and Mark were like buddies. And uh, the Dipples, I haven't seen them here today, but my daughter Michelle and Jenna, their daughter, were really good friends. Hardly ever seen each other anymore because Jenna doesn't live here. But the kids enjoyed being able to get on their bicycles, uh, to be able to just ride and do what they wanted to do with, and know, know where they're going to be and they'd be okay. We only had a couple of incidents that were not good ones, and that was later on after they got older. And I think that was because of everything that was going on out here, and just because of people. Did you have a favorite spot that you'd like to see today? Not really. I just wanted to see what, what had been done because I was waiting for it to become something special. And, and what, what I'm do you real think glad. Of what do you think? I haven't done the tour yet, mm -hmm. but from what I've seen, and I came out a few years ago, a friend of mine that's from Michigan, that's a neighbor, I actually live in Mount Bellevue now. And we went to Baytown Little Theater, and we had to pick up our tickets. So I said, would you like to see where I used to live? She said, yes, because I keep hearing about it, and I don't know what it looked like. So we drove down as far as we could drive, mostly down in this area where this is set up on the peninsula. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's great to see what has been done. The process had started then, but nothing was evident. I think it'll be great as an educational center. It's important. What do you think about, do you remember, have any really vivid memories of the storms, the flooding? Yes. They're not good memories. Uh, two years almost after we moved out here, they had the awful high tide that occurred that Jean Shepard talked about last night. When we moved out here, we were Baytown people. I had not lived here all my life, but I knew about hurricanes and we were not worried about the hurricanes. But what I didn't know, I knew my husband was a worrier, but I didn't know that he would start worrying when the low pressure started down around Cuba. And that was the worst thing. I know that when you're supposed to do something, you do it. And we had a storage building we rented for eight years, and we had an upstairs. We were fortunate to be able to move some things upstairs because your insurance does not take care of. I guess the worst other memory besides all the times that we moved, in one year we moved four times. <laughs> And the kids, I think it's traumatic, but they don't remember it as being really bad. They remember the better things, and that's important. The other thing that was so bad, I think, was just having to fight the insurance after we lost the home and fight the city for what is a considered replacement value when you paid your premiums. That's not fair. <clears throat> what, was, what do you think would be the best thing about living here? Oh, what I said, the, the convenience of the recreational area because we enjoyed the water. And having good neighbors is always important. Even though we had some neighbors that were renters, they were not bad people. They were good neighbors. They were conscientious people. There were a few that weren't, and I had friends that lived out here that had those. But I had friends that were moved out here as renters and became homeowners in another house and lived out here and was very active with the uh, Civic Association. Tom and Chloe Pierce, they lived right, right close to here. And I think it was a great experience. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. If you would please tell us your name and where you lived here in Brownwood. My name is Beth MacPhail Ailig and we lived at 163 Crow Road. Tell me some of your most vivid memories about life here in Brownwood. I think coming down was very important to us because it was the quality of life we were looking for for our children. And once we were here, we were, the weather didn't bother us. We just kept cleaning up and going back because having the open area and and having the trees and the water offered us everything that we were looking for in a lifestyle.
that we wanted to raise our children in. Tell me a little bit about your neighbors. Well, the Shimas lived across the street from us, and of course, Mrs. Shima was a, a flower person, and her yard was always so beautiful, and she was the one we went to for advice. And we were in a house that didn't have neighbors on either side of us, the way it was located. The lot next to us was vacant, and then the houses to the right of us all faced onto Linwood, and we had nothing in that way. But R.E. Norton and his wife Esteline and their son Gene lived kind of angled from us. And I guess some of my children's good friends were like the Pinas that lived around at the corner. And I had a Cub Scout group which brought all the kids in from uh, in the neighborhood. And we really had a, it, it was just everything anybody would want to raise their children in. It didn't bother us to go back and clean up each time that we had to do it. We just did it. That was all there was to it. We moved out many times in preparation. And then we'd camp <laughs> until season was over with. But I guess some of the things I remember were, were having the parties the kids all came and it didn't, it was after, after Carla, when you have a new house you're kind of particular about it, but after Carla you're not nearly as particular and you could relax and let the kids enjoy the house. And that's what we did. Was it Carla the one storm you remember the most? Oh golly. Yeah, because it was a shock. It wasn't what we expected. We didn't know what to do about it. We were lucky. We had good friends that lived on Queens Court and he came and got us. My husband worked for the light company and he knew he would have to be at work. But Ray Rushing came and he said, I don't know what you're going to do, but I'm going to move you out of your house. And he moved everything that we could get moved in about 18 hours. I had a grand piano that had been left to me as a gift from my father's grandmother. And it was the one thing we couldn't move. And when we went back in the house, it had floated up and turned over and gone the opposite end of the living room for us. And we couldn't salvage it. Uh, telling my dad about that was very difficult. They were gone and he couldn't imagine what had happened. But you don't move a grand piano well. You just don't. You leave it. But I was lucky. I still had the original furniture that I started housekeeping with. Pieces that my father made as wedding gifts for us. So I was able to get those out. I'm, you know. And in Carla we would have not had any damage to the house at all except rising water had a neighbor not been doing something very thoughtful and trying to save a cat. We'd left the cat in the house thinking she would be safe, and she was up high crying, and he saw her through the garage window, and he tapped the window out to get her out. Well, the minute she came out and got in the boat, she went wild, and so we didn't have her then. But that, I always appreciated that he cared enough to go back and get her, and that was the important thing. I suspect that it was just the shock of not anticipating what Carla was going to bring us. Now, when Alicia came and they said, you don't go back, I was relieved. There was no pain in that for me. My husband would have gone back. He'd have put it back together. But not me. I was ready to be done with it. 25 years was enough. Just enough for me. What, what do you think about what you've seen so far today? I am so pleased. I am so pleased. Mm. We've always felt like, you know, we kind of got had pretty good when the government bought us out. We got $1,500 for our house and our lot. That was about what the going price was in the very beginning. But now I see what they've done with it. I'm not unhappy about it. Our insurance paid off full. Uh, so we didn't get hurt too badly. It just, it just seemed like we were having something taken away from us that we had no control over. Uh, my husband worked through that kind of thing when he said, but I want to go back in there, things I want to salvage. Now why he did it will always remain a mystery to me. He took all the aluminum frame windows out of the house, every other rafter that he could get down, the roof wouldn't fall on us, a lot of the studs, and I said, what are we going to do with it? I don't know, but I bet I build something out of it. Well, we never used it for anything. We ended up having it hauled off. But that's how he worked through his frustration, was salvaging what he could. He had come from a family that his father was an itinerant traveling minister, Presbyterian minister, and they never stayed in one place very long. So when he had a home, he wasn't giving it up easily. He didn't mean to give it up easily. All my children were raised in Brownwood. All of them went to Burnett, Baytown Jr., and Robert E. Lee. Uh, good neighborhood. I look back at the times when they'd come in and say, we're going to go for a bike ride. And I'd say, fine, go. I wouldn't anymore do that now. But we could do it then. We could say, go run and play. Go be with your friends. It was just that neighborhood. It was good people. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. If you would, please introduce yourself and tell us where you lived here in Brownwood. Okay, my name is Bonnie Bartell. My maiden name was Glass. I lived at 123 Cabinets. Um, 
Lived here from 1951 till 1977. And um, remember so much about it because we were just, we had so much freedom down here. We rode our bicycles, we did whatever we wanted to. Halloween was just unbelievable because everybody was out. I mean, at night you didn't have to worry about stuff. And it seemed like everyone came to our yard. We were the last house before the wooded section on cabinets. We were the last house, matter of fact, in Hurricane Carla to have water and had the boats docked in our yard. And everyone used to come to our yard and play because we had a big vacant lot next to our house. That, oh my goodness, we'd play and play. And it just had an alley behind the house running up and down and, you know, the school buses and the people. And it just, it was fabulous. But I, I believe this is wonderful that they've done this, made something nice out of something that was so devastating. So, but matter of fact, our house was even here during Alicia and they finally moved it. So but it's not there anymore, but it's, it's nice. So. Tell us about your neighbors. Well, let's see, on one side we had the Fords, uh, Bubba and Patty Ford, and uh, then behind us were the Sheltons, it was Mr. Mary Shelton, of course, Billy Jack and Linda Shelton, across the street was the Jernigans, and most of them were older than me. I was, I was the, one of the babies of the neighborhood, and they were all, you know, uh, two or three older years older than me. We, we all played together. Everybody knew everybody. Everybody's daddy worked for Exxon, except one man worked for Roman Haas. I don't know who's come kind of out here. <laughs> and I ended up going and working for Exxon, just, just retired. But uh, gosh, we used to have neighborhood barbecues. We'd have the watermelon and go to everybody's house and have picnics. And it was just a, it's just like one big family down here in our section. Of this There were different, I guess, kind of different groups in Brown. We were out there on cabinets, all of us together. You know, there are just groups. Of, most of us went to the same church, and uh, all of us went to Bible school at Worcester Baptist Church. Everybody in that neighborhood, but it was it was fabulous. I just I hate that it fell off into the water. <laughs> but I moved to Dayton, and I like Dayton, so that's fine. So. Do you have a, a favorite spot that you maybe want to see today before you leave that uh, is special to you? We, well, we wanted to see where we're going to go and see where our house was, mm -hmm. but it, it was on the other end that we couldn't go from this side. But we saw all of it. It's just amazing to try to remember who lived where and what was where. And it was a beautiful place to live. I just, uh, I'm glad they're doing that. As a matter of fact, I was down here in 95 with Exxon. We had a cleanup down here and even mm -hmm. dug up a, a, a ginger jar uh, and made a lamp out of it. Don't know whose it was or anything. We still have the lamp. It's absolutely gorgeous, but uh, it, was, it was nice. So this is, this is wonderful. What was the best thing about life in Brownwood? The safety. I think the safety, knowing your neighbors, uh, knowing everybody's mom and daddy is, knowing all the kids and playing together and just, I mean, just doing anything you wanted to as a kid. You know, life was a lot different a long time ago, so. I mean, because we walked over, we rode our bicycle. We used to ride our bicycle from Brownwood through Lakewood around and get on the ferry and go to the monument. You know, that, that's a long way, but we rode everywhere, but we just, it was just playing kids, learn, learning to do, you know, playing freeze tag and hide and seek and climbing trees and <laughs> playing in the clover, making porch out of the clover and stuff. And it was a great place to grow up. So. Tell me about what you think about uh, what you've seen today. Oh, You're this is fabulous. This is fabulous. I think it is really going to be nice once, you know, they get everything done. It's just, uh, and the people that, that didn't live here, it won't be as much to them. But for those of us that lived here, this is just uh, so many memories, you know, just um, it's really nice. Thank a lot you. of work's gone into it. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the uh, storm where the boats were tied up into your front yard. Well, I was between the fifth and sixth grade, so to me it was cool. You know, we had water in our yard and all the other, you know, everything else floating in there. But they did, they tied the, the uh, I guess the Coast Guard or whoever brought the boats down, they brought them because we had the vacant lot next to our house and they tied them all along our trees, ours and the Jernigans. Because we had, I think, uh, a foot of water in our house, but we, I said we were the last ones to get the water, but we were kind of the, the stopping place to where the water was. You could, the people would, would crowd at our end of our driveway and stuff because you could see the water all the way down because you couldn't go any further but it, it was pretty interesting we have my sister has pictures she gave them to them and actually i have one of the baytown briefs and i, I don't know where it is right now that at from uh, it's humble brief that has all the pictures of the houses after carla and everything so i can remember going over on crow road with my daddy and watching that uh, they had a stick over there that had the tide how the tide rose that we'd sit there and just watch it watch it come up watch it come up and finally did so we were one of the lucky ones, though. Our house was all right. Do you have any memories about, like they had the pump house, about when they tried to raise the road? I remember them raising it, and I <laughs> always thought that was kind of a dumb idea because the water stayed in. The pumps weren't strong enough to pump the water out. They, they put that, that uh, 
uh, with a levee or whatever mm -hmm. around there. And it seemed like ever since that, the, the houses that were on the outside, they all floated off into the bay, mm -hmm. and the ones inside the water stayed in. But I know one interesting thing, where we lived on, we lived on Cabinets, it was mm -hmm. the main street, and you could always see the monument down at the end of it. And people would come down and stop and say, well, is this the road to the monument? So yeah, just get it real good, go real fast, you know. <laughs> but then you look down at Cabinets now, and the monument's sitting over here. It's like, what happened? <laughs> but that was kind of weird. But it just... Um, it's nice. I mean, our trees are still there. Our pecan trees are still there. The trees we planted years and years and years ago. So it's really something. So. Thank you very much for your right. time. Thank you for coming today. Could you please introduce yourself and tell us where you lived? I'm Carol McCullough. I was a glass girl. I lived at 123 Cabinets. I lived there from 1949 to 1967 with my parents and my two sisters. And what is one of your most vivid memories that you have of life here in Brownwood? Well, it was a wonderful time to grow up because you knew everyone. Uh, we had a vacant lot next to our house. Everybody came to our house to play. I can remember playing uh, tag football in the vacant lot next door. I can t remember teaching my middle sister, trying to teach her how to ride a bicycle, and she ran into this horrible thorn bush that was growing in the vacant lot. <laughs> probably never forgave me. Uh, <laughs> but it was just a wonderful time. Not that times are not good now, but back then you just, you knew everybody. I grew, I still am friends and keep in contact with one of the boys that lived two doors up from me and the girl that lived across the street. We are still very good friends. Tell us about your neighbors then. Uh, across the street were the Jernigans and Mrs. Jernigan, Minnie Jernigan and I shared the same birthday. Uh, June the 1st and we always had a birthday party together and homemade ice cream was at the top of the list for the birthday party and it was all the neighbors came. Uh, the Days lived next door to them and then across next door to us were the Fords and Miss Ford still lives on Cavanus and then uh, the Glens and we were all the kids were within a year of each other or the same age so it was just kind of neat. Tell us, uh, what do you think about what you've seen here today? This is very nice. I, I think this this is really very, very nice. Of course, my, my horror is that we're going to have another hurricane and it's going to destroy it. But while it's here, I think everybody should enjoy it. I just was concerned that you had to walk all the way through it. I kind of had to have a bicycle permit to ride. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have any, any other stories that you'd like to tell us about? No, I, I don't really remember much more than that. Did you go through any of the storms down here? I uh, only went through Hurricane Carla. Can you tell us anything about that? Uh, like my younger sister said, I remember the boats. I remember being woke up in the middle of the night, basically, and we had to get out of the house because the water was coming in the house. And fortunately, the Fords next door were not living in their home. They were out of the country, so we moved into their house. And uh, I remember uh, my dad putting the cats up in the attic, and I thought, why are you putting the cats in the attic? You know, it's going to flood. And I, I'm not even thinking, I'm like, you know, you're a kid. You're not thinking about how high the water's getting, but... It was, it was kind of traumatic. With Alicia, I wasn't here. I was over in Channel View, and that was really traumatic, too. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's just kind of neat to look at it. It was nice. I took the tour and to ride around and see what, what's left or what's there and what they're trying to preserve. So it's just kind of interesting. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Good afternoon. If you would please introduce yourself and tell us where you lived. Okay, I'm Catherine Glass Harbor, uh, Harbor and uh, those were my sisters that spoke ahead, and we lived at 123 Cabinets. And what is your most vivid memory of life here in Brownwood? The fun we had, because we had about 14 to 16 kids within a, probably a five-year age range. We had the vacant lot where we played the rag football, we played the basketball, we played the baseball, um, walked over to the bay. It was fun, and during the summers, that uh, mom would put up the big tarp in the backyard, and we'd do the mud pies, and everybody would come over. You know, we'd all meet under there, and uh, we had Kool-Aid houses, and you'd go get your Kool-Aid. Uh, we got out of school, of course, earlier than they do now, and we had a breezeway that was enclosed with jalouses, and we would start a Monopoly game Memorial Day weekend, and it didn't end until Labor Day weekend, and whoever would want to play would just sit down. We had sometimes, you know, make new money and things like that, but we kept that Monopoly game going. You didn't lock your houses. I never had a key to the house in Baytown. I lived there, I was 10 weeks old when the house was finished, and we moved in, and I left in uh, February of 69 when I married, and never had a key to that house. And so, and even for vacation, you know, we got a town two, three weeks, didn't, you know, you didn't lock your houses, because everything, you trusted everybody, you knew everybody. 
great neighbors. Uh, Linda Shelton lived behind us. We always said our, we lived behind each other because our houses backed each other. And so we had, and I keep in real close contact with her. They're in Rochester now. But, uh, you know, we just would always in and out of everybody's house. You knew, you know, you knew the people. They didn't care. You know, you didn't take advantage of them or anything like that. But you would go if you needed to go into their house. You know, you'd knock and go in and stuff like that. And, of course, Carol mentioned the Glens where Jeannie was a year younger than me. And so Jeannie and I played a lot together. And then Bonnie mentioned the alley. We used to go, there were bamboo growing behind the Wallstrom's house. And uh, Patty Ford, who was the oldest of the group, she was about eight years older than I was. She would go out there in the evenings. She was the first person I ever, said, uh, ever saw do the flashlight under the chin for the ghost stories. It would scare us to death, you know. But we had the, uh, mom and dad had the big garden. And so we had all the, you know, the fresh vegetables, shucking corn in the backyard, shelling peas. Just, and it was a wonderful place to grow up. It really was because it was just, I mean, we had school and stuff like that. We rode the bus. We had to go to the top of the street, regardless of the weather, catch the bus. Didn't stop at the driveway like it did later. And uh, I was a brownie and a Girl Scout, and we met at the Wooster Fire Department. Miss Nugent, who I think y'all will interview later, or maybe already interviewed, she was our, one of our uh, troop leaders. My mother helped, and we'd go up there and meet, you know, once a week. and. Uh, we would sell cookies, so walked all, we all walked all over this neighborhood selling cookies, and back when they were, you know, 35 cents a box and you got two dozen cookies. And, I mean, and we'd come out here, of course, to the point. We call this the point. They call it the little shamrock. But my favorite place, though, was the old graveyard. And after Hurricane Carla, of course, the uh, ground subsided so much we could see the caskets and things, so that was really, a, you know. And that, was, that happened, uh, Carla was when I was in seventh grade. And so we, uh, we had, uh, Dan Rather was on our street. We had the National Guard, like Monty said, we were the last house to get water. And I remember getting Mama waking us up that morning, stepping out into the water. And we had hardwood floors. And so the floors didn't warp because Mom had waxed them, you know, uh, every six months she was, you know, did the wax and everything. So we didn't have the, the problem. A lot of people thought we should have drilled holes in the floor because we were on blocks and the house was going to float, but it didn't. And when we went next door, like uh, the Fords were, I think, in Australia or Nicaragua, and so the Perhatchiks lived there, and they had gone to Cleveland because to get away from the storm, so we stayed at their house. And that was Labor Day weekend, and uh, one of the Lewis and Coker or Hinky and Pilot, somebody had the uh, Mellorine ice cream on sale. And of course, electricity went off, so we literally drank the Mellorine ice cream like milkshakes. Mama had that, you know. And like, you know, you don't think about stuff, you know, the electricity's off, but I remember them moved the car, they moved the cars up a driveway, and as the water rose, they'd take it to the next driveway, took the big TV, and back then they were the big TVs, you know. Daddy put in the freezer up on sawhorses out in the garage because it was it was like step down, you know. Uh, the cats in the attic and tr not being able to find all the cats and thinking some of them may have gotten, but they were all fine. We were blessed because there were weeds out on the other side of the vacant lot, and when the tanks tumped at Exxon, the oil, the line there was an oil line, and the oil didn't get in our houses, but on the other side people had the oil in the houses and things of this nature from the when the tanks tumped. tumped tell, over. Us, tell us more about that. I okay, well they floated and they've tumped over and that the oil in them came out and so it came into the bays but if where we lived it didn't get to us because it was filtered by the grass and daddy and and they kept the vacant lot mode because like that was our football field and it was literally the length almost the length of a football field so we play out there we played in the woods all the time we had uh, boat arc trees ones with the big green apples great boat arc trees but after hurricane carla we had poison ivy in the woods and we hadn't had it before and uh that was all you know that that was a great place we had tree houses out there we would, you know, we just, we played. We played and they had daddy and then fix some lights so we could play after dark. But of course in the summer, we didn't have the daylight savings time and anything like we do now, but still it would stay, you know, daylight pretty late. We'd be out there. Uh, you know, we all had TVs, but we didn't watch them. You'd watch TVs on Sunday night maybe, but uh, did all the, I mean, we just played and walked the neighborhood. I didn't ride a bike. I'm the one that didn't learn how to ride a bike, never. And, but uh, I, did, I did ride a horse all through here with a friend of mine and then we rode over to the, the monument. We used to do luau's, which are fun, and we would do. We all had the oleanders, and we'd make the big lays. And of course, they say oleanders are poisonous. We would hold that needle in our mouth with that thread, so obviously they weren't. And we'd bake these huge lays, and we'd keep them in the refrigerator. And then we'd have our luau's, and we'd have our lay, you know lays from Hawaii, the, the oleander lays. You know, and, and uh, mom and them had. Of course, we had all kinds of uh, fruit trees until Carla. We had apples and bananas. Of course, great fig trees. Uh, we had plums. And then, of course, like I said, the garden and all the stuff in the garden. It was great, like they, she mentioned last night, great place to grow stuff. It just was very fertile. And I'm a former Texas history teacher, and so uh, I was always thrilled with the bar house that was here. That's the one that the bar stayed in through Hurricane Carla, but that David G. Burnett slept there, and they had records of that. And that house, it's well, it stood through Alicia, 
And uh, when I was teaching Texas history, I would bring my students down here before they closed it all off and we would do the Baytown study so they could see all this. And I'd tell them this is where we played, this is where we did this. The trick-or-treating uh, and the trick-or-treating for money that they do now, like we did that. Uh, we trick-or-treated in high school for toilet paper though, so we could wrap houses. <laughs> <laughs> and this, you know, there's just all kinds of stuff. And there was a great group of kids. You know, you that you went to, of course, we went to Burnett Elementary together, and then we went to Baytown Junior High together, and then we went to Lee together. So we were virtually together from, you know, first grade, because we didn't have kindergarten, first grade through 12th grade, riding the bus, and then after you start, you know, stop doing that. So, what do you think about what you've seen today? I love it. Uh, I'm also, for, I taught um, life science to seventh graders, and this would be fantastic because we had to go to Anahuac. So, this would be better, this would be closer. Uh, we won't, probably won't have alligators here, but there were alligators at one time, you know, out in here. But uh, this will be great for the kids, and I'm, I'm hoping they'll, that it'll keep continue on. And it's fun because, like they said, the house slabs that are out here, you can say, I, I know the people that live there. The Lewis lived right there. I played over there. I spent the night over there, and now the house is gone. And, uh, it's a great place. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. <laughs> Oops. Good afternoon. If you would please introduce yourself and tell us where you lived. Um, I lived at 122 Bayshore Drive. My name, my maiden name was Massey, Patty Kroll, but my maiden name was Patty K. Massey. And I lived here before Carla. And as a small child, when Carla rolled in, it was a catastrophe. The neighborhood that we had known and loved was changed forever. And uh, my childhood friend who, Georgia, healed, who would not come, and be videoed. We uh, went back into her home. She had a wonderful library, family library, and all of those books were damaged by the flood. And we both indelibly have that memory of Hurricane Carla. What What was the worst? Was Carla the worst storm that you went through? Yes, by far the worst. But there were just wonderful memories of playing here in the neighborhoods. And my memory was the archaeology we would go and we'd just be digging in the backyard and there would be arrowheads and all sort of pottery. It was just a divine place to, to grow up. Uh, one of George's and my childhood memories, two of them are crabbing, did a lot of crabbing, and the other one was water moccasins. When we were didn't have anything else better to do, we would get the crab nets because certainly if a water moccasin was as far away as the end of a crab net, we were perfectly safe. So we would go out on the pier and get our crab nets and flip the water moccasins in the air. Those are my childhood memories. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your neighbors. 